The six part series that you're currently watching is designed to take someone who has little to no practical TIG welding experience through some of the more basic aspects of the welding process such as you know, simple machine setup and uh, operating the foot pedal, running some beads with and without filler metal, all the way up through some stuff that's a little bit more complicated like flat and horizontal position welds, inside corner, outside corner joints, fillet welds, that type of thing, all the way through, you know, welding out of position and even walking the cup later on in the series. One last thing to point out before we get started, and that is that this course is something you're going to go through at your own pace, so you know, here in part one, like I said, we're going to be starting off kind of slow, but if you already have your TIG welder set up and you've been running some beads and things are going well for you, you definitely have the option to go ahead and skip to the next part. For everyone else, I'm going to start things off by plugging in our TIG torch and we'll take it from there. Now depending upon which make and model of machine you have to work with, your connections might be a little bit different. But a few basic things are going to remain the same. You're obviously going to want to get your TIG torch attached to the welder. You're going to want to check your connections and make sure nothing's loose on your foot pedal. And then simply attach your ground clamp to your welding table to complete the electrical circuit. Next item on the list is shielding gas. For virtually all TIG welding, you're going to want to run 100% pure argon gas through a regulator or flow meter set to somewhere between, well what I like to use is about 20 to 25 CFH or metric equivalent. Now once again, depending upon the setup you're running, how you get the shielding gas flowing might be a little bit different for you, but with this machine, since it has an internal gas solenoid, well, we have to fire it up. And then once we've gone ahead and double checked all our gas connections, slowly open the argon cylinder. As you can see, we've got, what, about 1100 PSI on the inside of this tank. I'll open this all the way because with a shielding gas cylinder, cylinder as I've mentioned before, you get a leak-free seal when it's all the way closed and all the way open. Now I'll simply turn that little knob until the steel ball in our flow meter is hovering right around 25 cubic feet per hour. And then the gas shuts off. Now depending upon your setup, you might find that you're using a torch setup like this one with a manually operated gas valve. And if that's the case, then just give this a quick little turn. And as you can see, the gas starts flowing and uh, you can leave it open and double check that your flow meter is set correctly. And now that we have our shielding gas set up, let's just take a quick moment to talk about tungstens. That pointed metallic object, as you probably know, is referred to as a tungsten electrode. And, well, basically how TIG welding works is electrical current flows between the tip of that and your grounded workpiece. And that's how the arc is transferred. Because of this, you're obviously going to want to go ahead and make sure that it's in good shape. Now, I'm not really going to touch on tungsten sharpening too much in this series. Well, actually, I'm not really going to go there at all, simply because it's one of those things where everyone has their opinion upon what's the best way to do it. There's a lot of different ways to sharpen a tungsten and there's a ton of information already out there on the internet on that. So, um, well, what I usually do is just sharpen to a point which is approximately three electrode diameters long and I simply use this bench grinder and it works just fine for me. However, there's all sorts of specially made tungsten grinders out there on the market and like I said, just in the interest of keeping this video as short as it can be, I'm not really going to dive into this. But however you take care of them, you're going to want to have a number of sharp tungstens on hand because, well, if you're just starting out, you're probably going to be dipping the things left and right. Been there, done that, it's not fun, but you do get better. I recommend using 2% thoriated electrodes, and since we're going to be working with material that's approximately an eighth of an inch thick, I recommend 332nd inch diameter tungstens, and this particular pack is from our friends over at HDP America. So when should you swap out a tungsten? Well, the by the book correct answer on this is anytime anything happens to it, the tiniest little dip, the smallest amount of whatever gets stuck to it. But if you're just practicing, especially if you're just getting started, because like I said, if you've never done this before, you're probably going to dip a lot of tungsten, spend there, done that. 
And what I recommend for just the general practice work we're doing in this series is that you don't worry about the little stuff until it changes the quality of the arc, the shape of the arc, or the color of the arc. At that point, yeah, it's probably better just to go ahead and switch it out. But, uh, you know, anytime you're working on anything just, that's just for practice or maybe even some non-critical stuff, as mentioned, I wouldn't really lose too much sleep over it. Now you may be wondering, how do you go about swapping out a tungsten electrode? Well, I've got these two freshly sharpened electrodes fresh off the bench grinder. And I know some people talk down bench grinders, but you know, I got all of my TIG certifications running HTP tungstens sharpened on the school's bench grinder and uh, turned out alright. Basically, you're going to want to give this back cap a nice twist, lefty loosey of course, and ideally you should just be able to pull the tungsten out like that. However, if there's a ginormous ball of crap on the back end, you know, if you sharpen both ends and something happens, or if there's scratches on the side of your tungsten, for instance, if you got a little overzealous sharpening it, then that might not work. But if that's not the case, then you should just be able to put the new electrode in like such, and then tighten down this back cap again after you've adjusted for whatever stick out you want to run. And stick out, I'll take this opportunity to discuss that. It's the distance that the tip of the electrode sticks out from the end of our, no our nozzle or our cone, whatever you prefer to call it. And how much stick out do you run? Well, generally as little as possible, but primarily it's going to come down to what exactly you're doing and the type of joint configuration that you're running. But anyway, I'll just go ahead and give this a nice Nice firm uh, twist, but not too much because those are pretty soft threads in there. But anyway, if your electrode doesn't come out or go in the way I recommended, you simply twist this thing off. Don't let the electrode fall out the front. And just pull it out or put one in uh, as such. That's all there is to it. Now that we have our tungsten taken care of, let's talk about filler metal. And in this series I'm going to be using just some plain old ER70S-6 filler metal in both 332nd inch and 1 8 inch diameter sizes. Now although it doesn't exactly pertain to what we happen to be doing right now, I'm going to talk about what exactly that name breaks down to. The ER stands for electrode slash rod. We're going to be using it in the rod application, but it's also made in, in the MIG wire, so that's of course the electrode. And then there's the 70, which indicates that it has 70,000 pounds of tensile strength per square inch. And then the S-6 is just going to tell us a little bit about the chemical composition of the filler metal. Sometimes when they manufacture this wire, you know, they put a little bit too much oil on it, or sometimes there will be a tiny bit of crap, corrosion, whatever. If it's just really light stuff, you can run the wire through a scotch bright pad such as this, and that'll shine it up and get it perfectly clean for you. Now this is something I learned from our pipe welding instructor at school, the TIG one, and uh, it does make a difference. It's not the most ginormous difference ever. It's not exactly what I'd consider to be night and day. But it definitely does make the puddle feel a little bit cleaner while you're welding. And the finished weld does have a slightly brighter, shinier appearance. However, one thing I'll caution y'all is when you do this, you can take the copper coating off the steel rod. And for that reason, I recommend doing it right before you weld and not letting the rod sit around and get potentially rusty or, you know, or whatever, because you're obviously not going to be quite as well protected. And I always like to cut my TIG rods in half before I get started, just because it makes them that much more manageable, but that's also something you might want to consider if there's going to be anyone welding around you or working around you, so that way there's considerably less chance of poking an eye out. And if you're going to be cutting any of these rods, I recommend picking up a pair of mini bolt cutters. I got these things about a year ago or so when I was still in school. I picked them up from the local Lowe's for less than 10 bucks and they've been invaluable. Gnawing through 8 inch thick welding rods with a pair of side cutters uh, leaves you a little bit sore in no time at all. Now let's talk about what it is that we're going to be welding, YouTube. Well, I just went ahead and cut all these little steel strips out with a metal cutting circular saw. They are an 8 inch thick. They are comprised of cold rolled mild steel and they're left over from last summer. 
first trailer barbecue build, and I thought I'd use them up on this project. Now as mentioned, in this series we're going to be working with cold rolled steel. Why? Because if I used hot rolled, I'd have a whole heck of a lot of grinding to do, and I don't really want to do that, so I was able to acquire some cold rolled steel. Now what are the differences, you ask? Uh, as you can see, hopefully, I don't know how well the camera's picking this up, the piece on the right has a... I guess you could call it like a thinner coating on the material to keep it from rusting versus the piece on the left. The piece on the left is much less translucent, it's a totally different color, and the, its coating of mill scale, that's what it's called, is much thicker and it poses a significant problem if you TIG weld over it or through TIG it. TIG welding for all its merits is the pickiest, let's say, of the common welding processes when it comes to contaminants. You can't have rust, you can't have mill scale, paint, grease, oil, that type of stuff uh, will also cause major problems which include, you know, horrendous porosity, ugly welds, a really fugly sort of a brownish yellow smoky color forming around your welds, etc. And so you really need your steel to be clean. So you kind of have two options. You can clean up a piece of hot rolled steel, or you can just get some cold rolled steel, which comes without that heavy coating of mill scale. Alright, next up, let's talk safety gear. Now TIG welding is the process that everybody, well, alright, not everybody, but a lot of people like to cut corners on when it comes to protecting themselves from the arc. Why is this, you ask? I think it's because TIG is commonly what you see being done on TV by someone working on a motorcycle or a custom car, you know, in a t-shirt or a tank top or no shirt or whatever. So, you know, I think people see that and they figure it's okay. Or else they think, you know, it's the clean process. There's no smoke and mainly there's no spatter, nothing flying through the air. So, you know, you don't have to protect yourself from globs of molten metal. But what you have to keep in mind is when you're stick welding, MIG welding, flux core, whatever, you're not seeing pure electricity when you, you know, when you see a welding arc. You're seeing, aside from the electricity, bits of filler metal flying through the air, and there's also probably at least some smoke going on which can sort of work to absorb the light. With TIG, there's of course no smoke in theory, and there's also no filler metal traveling between the tip of the electrode and the workpiece. That is pure electricity, and there's nothing slowing it down between your workpiece and yourself. So, for that reason, you want to be extra cautious with it. Now, what kind of gear do I recommend for general purpose TIG welding, you ask? Well, I think the best thing you can do is to get your hands on a quality, lightweight welding jacket. Now, since we're not going to be stick welding or running flux core, MIG, or what have you, we don't really have to worry about, you know, globs of metal, molten metal spatter flying through the air. So we don't have to worry about wearing full leathers, but as mentioned, you do definitely want to protect yourself from the arc. And if you don't have access to one of these, a good, not frayed, so you know, good and in good shape denim shirt or canvas shirt works just fine. But there's two things you're going to want to check for. The first is, you really need to make sure it's constructed entirely of cotton, or better yet, flame resistant cotton like this jacket. Because if it's made out of polyester or some type of synthetic blend, and things don't go so well and you somehow end up on fire, you know, it's just going to melt to your skin, and that is... The results of that are horrific and not something I'd wish upon anyone. You're also going to need a good helmet, of course. I'd recommend, if you're working with a thick shade hood, keeping shades 10, 11, and 12 on hand for the type of stuff we're going to be doing. And you'll, of course, have to switch between them just based on, you know, the sensitivity of your eyes and personal preference. Alternatively, you can use an auto-darkening helmet like this one, which ranges from shades 9 to 13. You're also going to need, of course, a good pair of TIG welding gloves. Now I recommend using gloves designed specifically for the TIG welding process because you're not really protecting yourself from the same hazards you are if you're stick welding and the added dexterity of a properly fitting TIG glove is going to give you a big advantage in terms of torch and filler rod manipulation. Now before we start turning knobs and dials, I'd just like to take a moment to point out that, once again, exact setup procedures are going to vary a little bit just dependent upon, of course, the make and model of machine that you're running. But for the Lincoln Precision TIG 225 and many others, the fundamentals are the same. If it's a multi-process machine, you're going to want to make sure that you're in TIG mode. And when it comes to polarities, DC electro-negative is what you're going to be using to weld mild steel, stainless steel, titanium, and others. AC is primarily used in the TIG process for welding aluminum and magnesium, so we're of course not going to worry about that now, and thus we'll leave that alone. Pulse isn't something we're going to be using at the moment, and post-flow. 
For what we're doing, if you don't have quite enough post flow, you'll probably be alright, but I still recommend running a good 10 to 15 seconds worth. Now let's talk about amperage. Because this particular machine is controlled with a foot pedal, I'm just going to go ahead and turn this up to 150 amps and then adjust as needed. I probably won't get this high. 150 amps, as you know, would be running with the pedal all the way to the floor. And now that the machine's set up, we are only moments away from putting down our very first weld beads. So what are we going to be doing to begin, you ask? Well, stringer beads. <laughs> now why are we doing this, you ask? Well, because learning the TIG weld is a long journey and, as they say, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And your very first step is going to be pushing this little molten weld puddle two and a half inches to the other side of the plate. Now as you can see, I'm holding the tip of the electrode about an eighth of an inch off the surface of the plate, maybe a little less. And let's talk about that for a minute. You obviously don't want to have your tip in there too far because if you do you're very likely to dip it, but you don't want to hold the electrode too far back because your arc is going to wander all over the place. It's going to be very unfocused and almost out of control in a way. You can think of a TIG welding arc as kind of like a, um, you know, an inverted cone with the wide part down here and the narrow part at the tip of the electrode. And, you know, thus the further away we pull the tip of the electrode, the wider the base of this cone is going to get and the harder things you're going to want are going to be to control. But on the other hand, you don't want to hold the electrode in there too far because if you do, you're going to, you're pretty much guaranteed to dip it. But you're probably still going to do that anyway. Don't get, don't get discouraged, just grind the tungsten and get on with life. It happens to all of us more than we'd like to admit. The next thing we're going to want to talk about is push angle. When you TIG weld, you pretty much always want to go perpendicular to your surface or with a slight push angle. Now backhanded TIG welding does take place, you know, with welding you never want to say never. But it's really rare and it's not something I'm going to cover in this video. Nine times out of ten at least for general purpose TIG welding, you're going to want to use a slight push angle, kind of like this. Now as you can see I've gone ahead and turned the workpiece 90 degrees to show you all a different angle and in this respect you're going to want to be perpendicular to what we're going to be welding on. You don't want to be like this, you don't want to be like that because if you do your weld bead's going to be not perfectly centered down the axis of the joint. It's all going to be over here, it's all going to be over here. Probably won't be that big of a difference if you're just off by a few degrees but you definitely don't want to go in kind of like that just starting off. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is, once I put my helmet down, of course, I'm going to give our foot pedal a nice little push, I guess you could say. Think of it like you're uh, driving like a grandma leaving a stop sign. You just want to give it a gentle little nudge to get things going. The high frequency is going to jump from the tip of the electrode to the workpiece. An arc is going to establish, and then, well, a little puddle is going to form. We're just going to push it across. So let's do it. Alright YouTube, now just a couple quick notes on this exercise before we move on to the next one. First and foremost, how many of these stringer beads should you run or how long should you practice this? Well keep in mind the reason why we're doing this drill is to gain familiarity with starting the arc, operating the foot pedal or whatever it is on your machine. You're, you need to be able to start the arc, maintain the arc, move at least two and a half inches without dipping the tungsten and break the arc. When you feel like you've got that under control and you can do it reliably and repeatably, well, you're probably ready to move on. Now, what if you're having issues with this? Well, in my opinion, probably the single biggest issue a new welder is going to have with this drill, just based on my experience, not too long ago, as a new welder, is dipping the tungsten, just, you know, dipping it, dipping it, dipping it, 
And if you're really having an issue with this, what I recommend for this exercise is that you take your other hand that would normally be feeding filler rod and you use it to support your torch hand. Now you can get away with that here because it's obviously an autogenous weld, but don't make a habit of it because in the next exercise and, you know, very frequently throughout your TIG welding career, you're going to need your opposite hand to, of course, uh, you know, feed filler rod. But for now, just in this exercise, you can put your other hand here and use it to support the torch as well. And now just one last thing that I failed to mention is that although cold rolled steel is great for everything else we're doing in this series, it's probably not the best choice for this specific drill. What I mean by that is that although you can TIG weld cold rolled steel without grinding it under most circumstances and for most things and not have any issues, you know, it doesn't have the thick mill scale coating that hot rolled steel does, but there still is a little bit of a coating on it. And without the deoxidizers and scavengers that you find in filler metal being added to the weld, you might have a little bit of porosity since we're, you know, of course not adding the filler metal. And so for this specific exercise, you're really best off just grinding that coating off completely. Again, I apologize for not mentioning that, but it kind of slipped my mind. All right, let's move on. And the next exercise we're gonna do is commonly referred to as Stringer Beads with Filler. And as the name implies, it's pretty much exactly what we've been doing, with the notable exception that we're gonna be adding in some filler metal. So I'll just go ahead and uh, slice this rod in half just to make it a little bit more manageable. And now, let's talk about what it is that we are going to be doing differently. Now the first thing we need to do is become familiar with feeding the filler rod. Now, the way that I myself personally feed a filler rod and the way that many other people do is I pinch it with these two fingers and I pinch it with my thumb and then I release with the first two fingers, move them back, grab it further up the rod, release with my thumb and slide the rod forward and you know you do this gradually just as you weld and after you become familiar with it you have a little bit more under the hood time TIG welding under your belt you don't even think about it but the way I recommend learning this is to take like a a pencil or a piece of wire or a piece of filler rod or whatever and uh, you know whenever you're hanging out watching TV or what have you just sit there and feed it through your hands after a while it becomes second nature and then like I said you don't even really think about it so now let's talk about how exactly we add the filler metal to our weld puddle we're gonna be using what's commonly referred to as the dip technique because well it's relatively easy to learn and it's very very commonly used now the dip technique as the name implies basically means that once we have our weld puddle formed you know as we move it along you just dip a little bit of filler metal in there at a time and you work your way down the joint and feed filler rod as necessary. Now I like to maintain about a 90 degree angle between the vertical part of my TIG torch and my filler rod using about the same push angles we were using to just make our, our stringer beads before without the filler metal. And pretty much all I'm going to do is form a puddle, just dip a tiny little bit of filler rod in as I work my way down the joint. Let's see what that looks like. Now you may notice a clicking sound every time I dip the filler rod. Basically what this tells us is that I'm maintaining about the proper arc length. It's definitely a nice short arc and it's none too long. Now let's see how we did YouTube. Now I ran a couple beads just for the demonstration and then I ran one intentionally too cold and then the one next to that intentionally too hot just to show y'all what that looks like. But uh, basically if we have a look here, we can see that every time we dip that filler rod it created another ripple and uh, yeah, we pretty much just worked our way down the joint like such. And this is about what we're looking for. It's consistent, and as you can see, there's a smooth transition between the base metal and the weld bead. 
there's not a sharp ridge like there is right in here, which of course indicates that we're not applying enough heat to adequately melt this into this. You know, it's not flowing right, and well, that's how we get the ridge. And likewise, this is way too hot. As you can see, that there's just metal everywhere. It's sloppy, it looks baked. It has a baked appearance to it. And well, if you're well, it's, if it looks like a hot mess, you might want to turn down the amperage just a little bit. I ran these beads and got decent results on an eighth inch piece of material with a 332nd inch filler rod in the 70 to 90 amp range. You know, that's what the welder was actually reading out as I was welding. Of course, I had it set higher and I was using the foot pedal, but um, that's about how it went. And now that we've got that out of the way, I thought I'd just take a real quick minute to talk about scratch start TIG welding. Alright, scratch start is how a lot of people get, get started TIG welding, and well, that's how I got started. This was my first ever TIG rig. Well, not the torch because I broke that. Don't ask how, but the rest of this is what remains of my very first TIG rig, which I got in the summer of 2011, and I've been using it on and off ever since. What you need is a stick welder, an air-cooled torch, this lead, and uh, you know your argon cylinder and gas hoses. And basically, you take the power of a stick welder, you hook it onto a lug at the end of this lead, and you TIG weld with it. <laughs> It's as simple as it sounds. Now as I mentioned, scratch start TIG welding is basically, you know, it's like the love child of stick welding and TIG welding, and it is always hot. And not only that, but the way you strike an arc is kind of reminiscent. You know, when you're stick welding, you just brush the tip of the electrode against your workpiece and strike an arc that way. And when you TIG weld, you do basically the exact same thing, except you do it with a TIG torch. Per the name, Scratch Start, I'm actually going to scratch the tip of this electrode against our workpiece, which just happens to be, I'll put this where the camera can see it, it's just the uh, piece of metal that we were running beads on moments ago. And just like with a stick electrode, you just give it a brief scratch, and then you pull the thing back, you pull the uh, torch back, and hopefully an arc will emerge between the workpiece and the tip of the electrode. So let's see if it works. And then, of course, you have to manually turn off the gas. And that's basically how you strike an arc with a scratch start TIG rig. So now that we're in part two, we're actually going to start working on some various types of welding joints. And the first one we're going to be doing is called an outside corner. And I've chosen the outside corner for the first type of joint we're going to be welding because, in my opinion, it's probably one of, if not the, easiest types of joints to weld. Pretty much all we have to do is to make our way down the joint and uh, just apply filler metal as needed. There's already the sides which have been clearly drawn out and that'll help us keep things under control. And they can easily be rotated into the flat position to get everyone off to a nice, easy, gentle start. Now there are at least three common ways in which you can set up an outside corner joint. The first of which is to make a four-sided structure like this, but then if you want to rotate it into the flat position like we'll be doing to start off, you have to prop it up in a couple pieces of scrap angle like such, or what you can do is to make a triangular assembly. Now these are easy to put together and they have the obvious advantage of always having a joint in the flat position. However, since a true outside corner joint consists of a 90 degree angle, this isn't a by the book outside corner joint, but it might just work for doing a little bit of practice. The third and final way I'm going to demonstrate here is to make one of these W type structures, or I guess now it's more like an M. And now that we've discussed joint design, let's have a look at how I've got the machine set up. We're obviously still on DC electrode negative, and I've got the amperage readout set to 90 amps, and I'll be using the foot pedal to control that and I'll be using most of or all of that 90 amps. For filler metal, we'll be using the same 332nd inch and 1 8 inch diameter ER70S-6 filler rods that we ran yesterday. And we'll be using the same 332nd inch 2% thoriated tungsten as well. And assuming you're welding this in the flat position, like I recommend at least starting off, not a whole heck of a lot is really going to change. There's still the same approximately 90 degree angle between my piece of filler rod and the nozzle or the cone on my TIG torch. 
and I'm pretty much just going to start at one end of the joint and work my way across. Now a quick tip I'm going to give you guys before we actually start this, so you'll always want to make a dry run, or better yet a couple dry runs, you know you move your torch and your filler rod down across the length of a joint without actually welding, so you can see if your lead for your torch is going to get caught up on anything, or if for whatever reason you can only make it halfway down the joint, but believe me it's much better to figure this out before you start putting down metal than to have an additional stop and an additional restart. It should go a little something like that. I'll just hold the, uh, the cone here until the gas stops flowing and our weld is somewhat cooled. And let's have a look. Well, there's the finished product, YouTube. <laughs> As you can see, I pretty much just worked my way down the joint. And being that we're using the dip technique, of course, every time you dip that filler rod, a new ripple is created. Now, one of, if not the most important bits of advice I would give to a newer welder is that you want to be as consistent as possible as you make your way down the joint. And that goes for any welding process, but especially TIG, because if you're moving all over the place and you're not rhythmic at all, you have a higher chance of getting in there a little bit too close and maybe dipping your tungsten. My honest advice is to position yourself so you can move as rhythmically as possible with the most even motion that you can make down the course of the weld joint. And the other thing to keep in mind is it's really important to be as comfortable as you can get yourself. Now, sometimes working out in the field or when you're fabricating stuff, you know, you're gonna be cramped up in an odd position. But for now, just working on some scrap metal, sitting on a welding table, we can get pretty comfortable. Comfortable. Another tip which you might be able to get away with just depending on where you're working is you can actually take your torch lead and wrap it just once or twice around your arm and what this does is it takes the weight off of your wrist and that will again help you from shaking and help you to be just that much more consistent. However, if you're working someplace where there's people driving around on forklifts or what have you and there's any risk that this could get caught up in something and pull your arm off, then it's probably not a good idea. But as you can see, I'm just working alone out here in the garage today and so I'm obviously not too worried about that. And now that we've explained the basics, I'm going to go ahead and weld out a few outside corner joints and get the feel for welding these with the dip technique in the flat position. And uh, next up, we're going to try something a little bit different. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is TIG welding outside corner joints with the dip technique. And much like in part one when we were doing stringer beads, I recommend that that's something you practice until you get to the point where you can reliably make it all the way down the joint without dipping the tungsten. And, uh, you know, you feel like you can produce good quality welds and you can do it reliably and repeatably. So, now that we've got that out of the way, the next thing that we're going to be doing is another outside corner joint. Actually, it's the same exact joint. Uh, but we're going to be doing it differently. Instead of dipping our piece of filler metal as we weld, we're just going to leave it in the puddle and run it over. That's right, we're going to be trying out the lay wire technique. The lay wire technique is commonly used for TIG welding both pipe and plate. And well, that was actually my first encounter with it. But basically, uh, if this was a 45 degree bevel on a piece of, let's see if you measured it like that, it's probably like a good inch and a half, inch and a half thick plate, We'd have a tiny little opening here, maybe 3 32nd of an inch or so, and I'd lay my eighth inch filler rod across the gap and simply run over it with a TIG torch. 
And although we're not yet doing open root welding with the TIG process, we will later on in the series though, I think that an outside corner joint is a good way to introduce the technique and it does have its uses outside of open root welding. So let's try it out. Basically, I'm just going to set my filler rod down in there and give it a slight downward pressure. You know, I am putting a little bit of downward force on it, but I'm not trying to bend it in there flat or anything. Just, you know, if this is without any pressure, I'm going to be going in about like such and run it over and basically just melt everything together. Let's see what it looks like. There's the finished product YouTube. As you can see it is a much smoother looking weld than a comparable weld created with the dip technique. And the reason for this is because, well, you know, each of those ripples is created normally by dipping the filler rod, but since we're of course not dipping the filler rod, the only tiny little ripples we have, these are considerably much finer, are created by the side to side movements of the torch. So what do you want to keep in mind when you're trying out the lay wire technique for the very first time? Well, primarily that the way you control the amount of metal you're adding to the puddle is of course a little bit different because it's a, as you know a different technique and when you weld something with the dip technique and you're looking at your puddle and it looks kinda tall and kinda cold and you're like well I think I'm adding too much metal for the joint that we're running you just make smaller dips and that's that but with the lay wire technique because you're not making any dips you really just have two options. The first of which is to sort of pull the filler, the filler rod forward some as you weld so it kind of makes smaller dips so to speak but to me I don't really like doing that because it doesn't feel like the lay wire technique at that point. It feels like some weird combination of the two techniques. So what I recommend is that you go down a size of filler rod. For instance, if you're running an eighth inch filler rod, your puddle looks kind of tall and like there's just plain too much metal in it, you might want to go down to a 332nd inch. And likewise, if your puddle looks kind of hot and you're like, I don't think I'm adding enough metal to that for the amount of heat that we're putting in, then uh, you, know, you might want to go up a size of filler rod. Or you could simply adjust your amperage, but in terms of controlling the amount of metal that you're adding to the weld, well, those are pretty much your only options. And once you feel good and comfortable with your outside corner welding skills, ideally with both techniques, then, uh, well, I guess it's time to move on to lap joints. Now, as the name implies, a lap joint is formed when you take two pieces of material and you have one simply overlap the other. Now, how do you weld out a lap joint? Yes, well, it is relatively simple, but I feel like in terms of difficulty, it's a nice step up from an outside corner joint. Now, a lap joint is one of those joint configurations that you can weld autogenously if you so choose. However, for this series, I recommend the use of filler rod because one of the main things that I'm trying to help you guys work on is your ability to feed filler rod, and thus, I recommend getting as much practice as you can. I'll just go ahead and slice another filler rod in half here, YouTube. And basically, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is work my way down the joint, and while I'm welding, I'm gonna try to have the puddle just barely envelop the top edge of the top plate. You don't wanna melt like a half inch into the top plate, but you also definitely want to envelop that edge because if you don't go that far, then you're going to have to really shovel the filler metal in there and you're going to have an excessively large and ginormous and kind of messy weld. So again, when you're welding out a lap joint, you just want to watch for the puddle to just barely consume the top edge of the top plate. Let's see how that looks. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our lap joint. Now let's take a moment to talk about lap joint troubleshooting. Well, aside from the various types of common TIG welding problems you can have, like the ones we covered in that troubleshooting video, which was homework the other night, 
pretty much all there is to go wrong with the lap joint is the fact that you can weld with too much of the top plate or not nearly enough of the top plate. And if you're taking off too much of that top plate, you're going to know because you're obviously going to see yourself cutting way into it, way past that top, you know, initial ridge. But you're also going to have a very large weld puddle to contend with because let's say your bottom toe line is supposed to be here and your top toe line is supposed to be here. But you're not where the top toe line is supposed to be. You're all the way back here. So you're going to be trying to maneuver the torch back and forth, uh, you know, across an excessively large weld puddle. And that's just going to introduce a lot of heat and it might look kind of sloppy once you're actually done welding with it. On the other hand, if you're not taking off enough of the top bridge, then you're not going to have enough metal to work with because a lot of the filler metal is actually from that top plate, not just what you add. In fact, sometimes, like I mentioned, if you weld a lap joint autogenously, all your filler metal is from the top plate. So if you find yourself just shoveling metal in there, uh, you know, you really want to make sure that you're actually taking off that top ridge because otherwise, you know, you just might want to come in a little bit more. And with that out of the way, I really do hope this video will greatly benefit your welding endeavors. I've chosen these joint configurations for part two because I honestly do feel like they're a nice stepping stone between running your first TIG beads just on some flat scrap metal and the more difficult joint configurations like the inside corner and the fillet weld that we're going to be doing later on in part three. And now that we've made it all the way to part three, it's time to start running some inside corner and some fillet welds. Now the next thing I want to talk about is the difference between an inside corner joint and a fillet joint. As you can see, an inside corner is comprised of just two pieces of material that intersect at a 90 degree angle and we'll be welding obviously the inside of it and the opposite of this is of course an outside corner just like the ones we welded in part two of the series. And a fillet weld on the other hand is where two pieces of material come together at a 90 degree angle but they're not at the corners. As you can see, this corner meets this corner but here we have the corner which meets, well, not necessarily the middle but the inside of the plate, let's put it that way. Because of this, in my opinion, inside corner joints are considerably easier to weld. Well, maybe not considerably, but I do think they're a little bit easier to weld because it takes an identical amount of heat, theoretically of course, to melt this plate and this plate because they're both edges. However here, this is going to take less heat to melt than the inside of this. Another reason why I recommend starting out with an inside corner joint is because, you know, when you're just starting to learn to weld, I think you should make things as easy on yourself as possible. And by that I mean that you should probably start off welding in the flat position. And if you're going to be welding inside corner joints, you can just make one of these W structures or an M structure. And you have the joints that just naturally sit in the flat position. Whereas, on the other hand, if you tack together a bunch of these two-plate fillet weld assemblies, they're going to naturally sit in the horizontal position, and you'd have to prop them up against something, or tack them to your table, or whatever you want to do. So overall, I'm just going to start out at one end of the joint, and uh, manipulate the foot pedal to get the arc going, at which point I'll melt this plate and this plate, then I'll add a little bit of filler metal between them, and simply work my way down the joint. I'll be using the same 2% 3 8 tungsten that we've used throughout the entirety of this course. And uh, notice the stick out, how it's considerably longer than what we'd have to use if we were running a lap joint or an outside corner. Now part of that is because, you know, sometimes it can be a little tricky for the camera to pick up what's going on and for me not to block the shot with the, uh, with the cone or the nozzle. But the main reason for the longer stick out is because when you're running an inside corner, you actually have to get down inside the joint. Whereas with an outside corner, you can basically just hover above it. I'll be using an eighth inch diameter ER70S-6 filler rod. And with that being said, let's make one last dry run and start putting down some metal.
as mentioned, the single biggest difference between an inside corner joint and a fillet weld is the fact that we're no longer welding two edges together. We're welding an edge to basically a middle. But aside from that, there's not too much that's different, with the exception that in this series, I think this is a good transition point to go from welding in the flat position, like we were doing with those W-shaped uh, you know, assemblies, to the horizontal position, which is of course when your weld just sits on the table like such. But, you know, we are trying out a new joint configuration, and if this is something that gives you problems, then it's not a bad idea. You know, there's no shame in turning a couple fillet welds into the flat position and, uh, you know, welding them out as such just to get your confidence up and build your skills a little bit, at which point, you know, I recommend returning to the horizontal position. Now when I weld a horizontal fillet weld, I don't like to go straight into the joint like I'm doing now. What I like to do is to turn it sideways a little bit, so I'm working from kind of an angle, because if I'm facing this thing, then, uh, you know, it can be a little bit more difficult to position the torch. That's not to say it can't be done, but I find that I'm much more comfortable if I can tilt it like such and weld away. And that's what we're left with YouTube. Something else to point out is that if you're looking to conserve metal, you can always turn your lap joints into, well, just about any type of joint configuration you can think of. All right, YouTube, and now that we've got the fill weld wrapped up, well, I think that part three is coming to a close. And you're watching part four of my Teach Yourself How to TIG Weld series. And the first thing we'll be talking about in this installment is out of position TIG welding. Now if you're going to be running TIG out of position, well, you're in luck because the gas tungsten arc welding process is one of, if not the least position sensitive of the common welding processes. I remember when I was first learning to TIG weld, one of my teachers said that TIG doesn't really care what position you're in so much, and uh, I'd say that he summed things up well. In my opinion, the hardest part of TIG welding out of position is somehow managing not to impale the weld puddle with your tungsten. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's kind of a trick not to do that while you're sitting down at a stool all nice and comfy on your bench, working on your bench, and uh, much less when you're standing up in a much less natural position and you gotta work your filler rod and don't stab your tungsten with the filler rod. That's another thing that I really struggled with <laughs> in school welding out of position. And uh, so, pretty much the hardest part is just staying comfortable and positioning your torch. Now as you can see, I've taken some scrap metal and positioned an inside corner joint on some more scrap metal. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is how to hold the filler rod when you're welding vertically. And rest it further up the joint, hopefully out of the area that's going to become really hot, and simply feed the filler rod as such. Now this is of course completely subjective to the type of joint configuration and the size of the joint and how it's positioned, but whenever possible, I like to just pretty much modify the motion I'd use on the table, you know, with your hand resting here, you just feed the filler rod in, simply put it up above the joint. And now that we've got the filler rod side of things under control, let's talk about a few different ways which you can hold the TIG torch when you weld vertically. Now, these are the three methods that seem to work the best for me, and I figured I'd just pass them on to you guys and let you decide what works best in your specific application, but the first of which is pretty much exactly what we'd be doing if we were welding flat. Actually, the first two are pretty much directly carried over from welding in the flat and horizontal positions. And the first method is to simply position the body of the torch directly over the axis of the weld and just work your way up the joint as such. The second method is to come in at a 90 degree angle, you know, you just turn the torch sideways. And the third method is to actually flip the torch upside down and work your way up the joint as such. Now as mentioned, the hardest part of welding out of position with TIG is being as comfortable as you can be and not dipping the tungsten, even though I'm not as well supported and I'm a little bit shakier than I'd be if I was sitting on a stool working at the bench. But one thing I am going to do, again, is just 
wrap the lead around my arm a couple times. This is only held down with a magnet, by the way. And that's going to work to take the weight of the lead off of my wrist and hopefully let me be a little bit more steady. But a side note on this, don't do it if there's any chance that like a forklift or someone driving by could catch this lead and pull your entire arm off because, well, take welding one-handed, I'd imagine that's a little bit harder than welding with two hands. I'll just slide that back over there and let's begin. A little bit shakier, but the puddle itself felt almost exactly the same as it did working in the flat position. Now obviously, even though TIG isn't a very position sensitive process, you can't turn gravity off so it is going to be a little bit different. And what I like to do is to simply use a slightly steeper push angle than I would in the flat and the horizontal position because gravity is trying to pull our puddle down and I'm just making an attempt to kind of shove it back up in there. The next thing I want to discuss is welding thick metal with TIG. Simply because this is the third Teach Yourself to Weld series I've put together. As you guys know, I also did one on short circuit MIG and stick welding. And in the stick one, and I guess in the MIG one too, I mentioned, you know, the various things you'd have to do to weld really thick and really thin materials with the aforementioned welding process. And I haven't really covered that with TIG yet, so I thought I'd take just a moment to do that. TIG is an excellent process for welding thin material. If I had to weld a lot of thin stuff, again, I'd choose to TIG weld it simply because of the high level of controllability you have by manually adding filler metal and manually manipulating this torch. It's kind of slow. You have a huge amount of control over what's going on. And for that reason, when you see people welding like razor blades or beer cans together, you know, they're not stick welding that stuff. They're TIG welding it and there's a reason for that. And you have to look at it from an employer's perspective too. You know, TIG is an expensive process to run. It takes expensive machinery and you don't put down nearly the amount of material in a set amount of time that you would running flux core, mega stick, or a handful of other processes. You don't put down very much material at all. And you know, your average TIG welder doesn't exactly work for peanuts, let's say, even in comparison to some of the other processes. Thus, you're probably not going to go anywhere that is going to pay you to weld on like one inch thick steel with the TIG process. If they do, maybe it'll be like a root pass and the rest of it's filled up with something else. Mainly because it's cheaper for them to weld thick steel with other processes to put down more metal much faster. And for that reason, TIG is generally left for intermediate thickness and, uh, and thin thickness material. But again, don't take this as an always and you'll never find this case. I'm sure it's happened, probably critical stuff out there. As I've said before, welding's just such a vast field. You can never say never when it comes to welding. But overall, once again, focus on thinner material, not thicker material with TIG. And one last thing, YouTube. Well, I think it's time that we talk about walking the cup. If you've made it this far, you can get your machine set up, you can run stringer beads on flat material, do some of the simpler weld joint configurations, and even some of the more complicated ones. So in keeping with that upward progression of your newfound TIG welding skills, well, I think it's time you start playing around with cup walking. It's, a really, it's really fun, it's an excellent skill to have, and it's uh, something that I made a video about last summer, and I didn't really want to try to recreate that. You know, I thought about maybe like taking some of the footage from that video and putting it in this video, but then I'd leave stuff out of it. I just didn't like the idea. So basically, when part four closes, like it's about to, I highly, highly recommend watching that video if you want to learn to walk the cup. And tonight we're going to be doing a little bit of walking the cup. I'm just out here in the shop and I figured I'd put this video together. Why you ask? Because I'm a TIG certified, socially awkward 20 year old who makes YouTube videos about welding in his mom's garage. And a few people have asked to see this YouTube video, so I figured why not. And uh, so, you know, I got a nice assortment of stuff laid out. I got my TIG torch. We're actually, fun fact, using my stretch start TIG rig because I have a bunch of requests for scratch start videos. And we're just running that off the old stick made here. So we got that. I got a couple of inside corner joints because I honestly feel like those are the easiest way to start walking the cup. And then we'll do it on an open root joint and go from there. All right, so I guess to start off, what is walking the cup, you ask? Well, 
Simply put, it's when you take yourself a TIG torch like this, and that pink thing, as you know, is referred to as the cup. And what you do is you take your TIG torch and you set it inside the joint, and you pretty much just pivot that cup back and forth, make your way down the joint, you can get a nice little weaving effect, you know, a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. This actually isn't walking the cup, this is wiggling the cup because, as you can see, we're just wiggling our way down there. If I was walking the cup, I could do that on the south side bevel, and that's, they call it walking, it's really more of a pivot, but I'm gonna show y'all how to do both, and uh, I'll give you a demonstration in each of them. So, all right. We got that, you know, inside corner joints, that eighth inch filler metal is what we're going to be using. We got some 332nd inch, 2% thoriated tungsten. I'm pretty sure these are the thoriated ones. I don't know, I sharpened them out to both ends. And, uh, you know, we're going to be setting up an open root joint. So we got that, we got our gloves, we got a couple wire brushes. TIG, as you know, does not like any sort of contamination whatsoever. You know, walking the cup looks really complicated, but to an extent there's really nothing to it but to do it. So, alright, first off, we're going to do a nice dry run down one of these inside corner joints and then we're going to fire up the welder and do it for real. Now why an inside corner joint you ask? Uh, well because quite simply this requires very little metal, it requires very little prep work and when you're welding it because it's a flat position weld you don't have to worry about putting the bead all up on one side and preventing gravity from sucking it back down and it's the hardest to screw up weld joint, don't get me wrong, I've screwed up plenty of them myself, but you know, if you start to go up one side of the joint too far, you just fall back in, you don't have bevel edges to worry about, nothing like that. So I feel like a flat position inside corner joint is probably going to be the way to go if you've never done this before. Now we're going to be welding with what's referred to as the lay wire technique because to nobody's great surprise, you just take your wire and you lay it into the joint and then you take your TIG torch and you pretty much just uh, just run it over. You, well, another thing to keep in mind is that you can't just rest your filler wire in there like I was kind of doing. It's looking at the camera. You have to because well because if you do, you can slide around or you know you move your body a little bit to reposition yourself for the weld, and uh, this just slips and goes forward and impales your tungsten. That's a really bad time. This is more of an issue on pipe than it is in a 1G inside corner weld. Again, you know, probably not a bad way to start out. But uh, it's a good habit to be in to put a little bit of downward pressure on your filler metal. You know, this is just mild steel ER70S6 filler, so it's going to bend a little bit. Now, I wouldn't do this right here if I was welding right here. I'd be a few more inches up the joint. But all you do is you put a little bit of downward pressure in. You don't have to, you know, bend the piece of filler wire or anything. Just enough pressure to hold it in place. And uh, then you just run over the end of it here. Now, another thing to keep in mind is this is more wiggling the cup than it is actually walking the cup. If I was walking it, it would be more of a pivoting. See, I can't even really simulate that. We're pretty much just wiggling it back and forth, side to side, and we are making our way on down the weld joint. Now, I highly, highly, highly recommend you make a few dry runs down the joint without, you know, without the welder turned on, without any gas flowing. Uh, just to get the feel for what exactly you're going to be doing, just sort of watch yourself and work your way down the joint. And what you might want to do is experiment with a few cups. If you're teaching yourself this out in your garage or whatever, I highly recommend getting, to start off with, a number 6, a number 7, and a number 8. Now these are in 3 six, or 1 16th inch sizes, so for instance the number 6 cup is going to be 6 16ths of an inch, which is 3 eighths. So this inside opening here is about 3 eighths of an inch. You know, to be honest, I'm not too particular about cup sizes. I know some people are for some things. Um, I don't know. I guess I'll... I had the 7 on here. I kind of played with this before. But I think a number 7 would be good for this type of joint, assuming you're running a 332nd inch tungsten. You know, if you use too small of a nozzle, you won't get quite enough gas flow. You know... In order to walk the cup or wiggle the cup, you have to have something to wiggle it against. And here on the edge, like where you can see I've tack welded it to the bench down here, there's not really anywhere to do that. So what you have to do is replicate that motion with what's known as the freehand method, which would be to go kind of like this, not, not resting the cup on anything, not moving it side to side, until you get into the joint and you can rest it on the sides and then move it against the sides. But, you know, freehand, it's, an, it's not really better or worse, it's just one of those things you use as the situation calls for it. And uh, I'm not really going to get into that in this video because it's a walk in the cup video. So just for practice, assuming you've never done this before or anything, I'm actually going to start with the cup on the ends of the thing and we're going to not weld probably a half an inch here just because, you know, basic beginner video, we're not going to worry about it. So let's go fire up the welder. <laughs> 
And now we're just going to crank up the good old Hobart stick bait. Now, like I said, I'm running a scratch start TIG rig, which means no high frequency, no aluminum, uh, pretty much just DC current and adjust it at the welder, no remote. So, all right, we're pretty much just going to fire this thing up. As you can see, we're already on electro negative, and we're reading a little over 90 amps. It feels like this is probably about 100. I'd recommend starting this somewhere between about 90 and 110 just depending if you like to weld a little bit hot or a little bit cold and uh, you know realistically we have no idea how accurate that dial is I love the welder but I don't think it's very accurate so we got that and if we open up our gas flow thing you'll see that we are running a little over 20 CFH of argon yeah about 20 is good alright so let's do it And that's all there is to it, YouTube. It's actually quite easy once you get the hang of it. The kicker is it does have one heck of a learning curve. In fact, the first multiple times I did this, it was it was bad, man. It was really bad. But, you know, it's just like with pretty much anything else in welding, all it comes down to is a lot of practice and, you know, you get out of it what you put into it. So, uh, one more thing I'd like to just talk about for a second is stick out. Now, I like a little bit of a longer stick out than some people, and that gives me a longer push angle. Uh, yeah, that, that's what it is, a longer push angle. And that spreads out the metal a little bit more. It puts down a thinner layer of metal, but I think it leaves a nicer looking bead than a shorter stick out, thus a smaller push angle and a thicker layer of metal. And that's the stick out I was running. I'd say that's probably a quarter inch to five sixteenths. You know, it's a little bit more than you'd use for some other forms of TIG welding, but with the lay wire technique and the walk in the cup technique, well, that's about how I like it. Now that was so much fun, YouTube. I think we should do it again. As you can see, I've just gone ahead and put the number eight cup on this torch because since we're not reaching all the way down into the bottom of the joint, you know, we can have a wider cup that's not going to reach all the way down into the bottom of the joint. So pretty much I'm just going to get started here again and, uh, and wiggle my way across. Kind of hard to do this looking through a camera screen. All right, I'm trying too hard. Just be watching me. I'm nervous. There. That's about what I want. And uh, yeah, it's we're filling in a wider part of the joint, so I'm going to be doing a little bit of a wider motion. And this would be the point where wiggling the cup starts to look an awful lot like walking the cup. Now everybody will tell you the walking the cup is somewhat reminiscent of moving like a big steel 55 gallon drum. That seems to be the cliche everybody uses. But you know, when I first heard that, I imagined some kind of side to side, banging the edges on the ground kind of deal, kind of like this. 
But in reality, walking the cup is more like pivoting the cup. You're pivoting, you're pivoting along that bottom edge and you're turning it this way to tie into that side, that way to turn into that side with a slight rolling action. It's a lot more gentle and controlled than... Root pass time, YouTube! I'm gonna do this just the same way that I did, you know, those inside corner joints. We're pretty much just gonna set the wire in there and run it down. <laughs> So here's my masterpiece YouTube. Yeah, I pretty much just laid the wire in there and went for it. And as this plate started heating up, I started wiggling it a little bit faster. And that's, uh, that's about what we ended up with. Now you can see a nice restart right in here. And when you make a restart on root pass with TIG, all I do is I will heat up the previously deposited metal. I'll wait for it to keyhole just a little bit. You don't want a lot of a keyhole with, a, with TIG, especially if you're doing the lay wire, but I like to see that it's all melted, so I let it keyhole just a little bit. Then I shove the wire back in there, plug and chug, and keep moving. Now let's flip this thing over. And back here you can see we have a nice, even, smooth, consistent root. And, uh, you know, this is what you like to see, because if you're welding on a pipe or something, you put in a root that penetrates like a friggin' quarter inch or whatever, something ridiculous, then that can restrict the flow of whatever's going through the pipe, and, uh, you know, it can cause turbulence and some other stuff. That's the restart. That's on the back. You can kind of see where it is if you look for it. So, let's flip it over and uh, put in another pass. Well, YouTube, I guess we can shut off our argon and turn off the welder because this weld is officially done. Come on, turn. There we go. Well, there we have a nice flat to maybe slightly convex cover pass. And uh, pretty much all I did was what you saw me do last. You know, you just pivot that thing back and forth. It's not so much of a walk, you know, as in side to side as it is a pivot. But, you know, like I said, it's just something that comes in time. And anyway, I guess we're going to cut this out. Okay, YouTube, so we got the first piece set up in there. We're actually going to be bending the root first. And, um, yeah, pretty much just sliced out the straps, flattened them down, and rounded off the corners to prevent corner cracks. So here we go. Are we hitting the weld? I think we're hitting that weld. Alright, testing the face, here we go. That one I think was pretty close. It's only slightly candy cane-ish. As you can see, I got the welds really close to dead on. And uh, if we look on the other side here, you'll see that we got... Uh, hmm. that, that's not coming off. That's a speck, YouTube. We have one tiny little speck between these two, uh, with, between these two things, but otherwise they've been totally clean. I really hope that y'all have picked up a thing or two from it. Uh, walking the cup is a really fun technique and the thing is when I first learned to do this the guy that was teaching me said once you have it, you have it. You can use it on pretty much any joint configuration. 
Uh, and you know, even when you haven't but even when you haven't done it in a few weeks, you just practice a little bit and you're right back to it. And I was like, nah, that's crazy. The first few times I did it, because my first attempts were not pretty. But you know, it's. It is what it is. It's a nice technique. Once you understand how to do it and you're over that really steep initial learning curve, then it's pretty easy. And today we're going to be talking about, according to my cheat sheet here, uh, about a dozen of the most common problems that people who are newer to welding and specifically newer to TIG welding are going to face. We're going to be talking about setting your amperage. We're going to discuss arc length, filler metal, how much you're adding, how much is too much, and how much is not enough. Stick out, tungsten contamination, gas flow, gas type, polarity, and uh, maybe something else towards the end of the video. We'll just see how things go. Uh, but, yeah, I'm making this video because back when I first started TIG welding, I'd watch a bunch of people's videos on YouTube and see a bunch of pictures around the internet of gorgeous looking TIG welds. I was like, oh, that's really cool, but yeah, mine, uh, yeah, maybe they don't look quite that nice, and, you know, I didn't really know how to get from where I was to where I was headed, so to speak, you know, in terms of welding, and, uh, well, in terms of a number of other things, too, but for now, we're just gonna deal with the welding part, so I figured that I'd put this video together for y'all, and we're gonna screw up some welds, we're gonna talk about what causes this problem, uh, what the symptoms of it are, and how to fix it, and, uh, so I guess the first problem we're gonna talk about is running too much amperage. This is probably the single biggest problem I had to get over when I first started TIG welding. This is what I did like all the time. Screwed up a lot of welds, had a lot of undercut. But all right, let's talk about amperage. A good weld is the proper ratio of heat to filler metal. I mean, if you're running really small filler metal and a lot of amperage, then you're putting too much heat to not enough metal. It's gonna sink in there too much, so to speak, if that makes sense, and you're gonna have a lot of undercut. And in my opinion, the worst thing you can do for the aesthetics of a weld is to run it with the wrong amperage. I, I don't mean you're like five amps off. I mean you're like 50 or 100 amps off. That is a hot mess right there, and this is exactly what a TIG weld that's done way too hot will look like. As you can see, we have some undercut, which as you know is a ridge that's been melted into a piece of parent material and then not filled in. And um, you can see how it's just, it just plain looks like a mess. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the best way I can describe it. It looks overcooked, it looks burnt it looks kind of gray and, and nasty and that's that in all of its awesomeness the TIG weld done way too hot now like I said this is an issue that I had all the time maybe not quite that extreme but I used to bake the crap out of stuff pretty much every time I TIG welded things and as you can see this is just plain too much heat for the amount of metal we're working with it's too much heat for eighth inch thick you know base material and a 332nd inch filler rod but you know, if we were to increase the amount of metal we're working with without adjusting the amount of heat that we're using, it'd turn out awesome, you know, assuming we did some other things too. But that's just plain, like I said, it's just plain too much heat for what we're doing. So now that we've covered what a weld that's done way too hot looks like, let's do one that's way too cold. Taking forever to melt the base metal and get a puddle going, YouTube. Now, try not to do that. <laughs> 
too short, YouTube. I got people on the internet to argue with. And a tungsten to grind. And the problem with welding too cold is A, it takes forever and life's short and I have things to do before I die, as do you I'm sure. Uh, but the main problem is that because we don't have enough heat to adequately fuse things together, I mean there's virtually no penetration, I'm sure there's not really acceptable fusion here, and this is just plain going to be a very, very weak weld. And in fact, if I had not welded these samples together on the back, I'd actually just uh, break this for you off, because I'm, I'm sure that would not hold a lot. So, what are the symptoms of a cold weld? Well, if you're TIG welding, it's going to take you forever to get a puddle started. That's going to be your first indication. And then things just plain aren't going to go well. They aren't going to flow, flow well, rather, I should say. You know, when you're welding with about the right amperage, you have that nice puddle, you just stick your filler rod in there, and, uh, and the puddle takes more metal from your filler rod, it just kind of wets out, and you just keep moving down the joint. And it should feel like it's kind of going naturally, it has a nice, smooth, natural progression. And when you're welding too cold, you got your little puddle, it won't be as big as it should be probably, and uh, you stick your filler rod in and it doesn't want to take the metal off of it, and you sit there and heat it with your torch, and you pull the filler rod out, and then your puddle's like really convex, and then you try to push it side to side a little bit, and try to help it flatten out, but that may or may not do enough depending on if you're welding a little bit cold or a lot cold and uh, it's just one of those things where you're gonna have to get the feel for it I highly recommend that if you have some scrap metal in a TIG welding setup you do what I just did you crank your welder up way higher than it's supposed to go and you run a bead with it and you turn it way down and, and you see what it's like and that way if you're welding and it vaguely resembles one way or the other way then maybe you know to give it another 5 amps or you know a little bit more pellic so to speak and a big thanks to Keith for suggesting this. Uh, yeah, he's the person that brought this up in the, uh, in the Facebook post I posted looking for ideas. And one other thing before we switch to our next topic, how would I weld these amperage-wise? Well, you know, there's... Welding's one of those things where more often than not there's a number of ways you can accomplish something and it's going to be just as good as a number of other ways you could use to accomplish it. Uh, my background in TIG welding is I was actually trained to be a pipe welder. I hold five certifications, two of which are TIG, both of which are on 2-inch pipe, 2G and 5G, TIG all the way out, x-ray test. And because I went to a school that teaches pipe welding, you know, we learned more of the multi-pass way of doing things primarily where if you have like a big old schedule 80 pipe with I don't know like a three-quarter inch or, or one inch depth of bevel you don't attempt to fill that with one pass because it would be a huge mess it would take like a huge ridiculously big 700 amp machine or you know some along those lines so what you do is you put in a number of passes and each one of those would be between 90 and 110 amps I'd say so because that's how I learned to TIG weld that's how I like to TIG weld things. So I'm going to TIG weld something. Uh, you know, if, if it's that, I'd probably run that at about 90 amps with 332nd inch filler. Maybe 8th inch. Maybe 100 amps and 8th inch. Uh, but that should give you, hopefully, a little bit of a ballpark. All right, let's move on to our next ways to screw up a weld. Arc length, as you probably already know, at least when you're TIG welding, is the distance between your puddle and the tip of your, in my case, mildly contaminated tungsten, which I should really change out. Uh, but arc length is one of those things that... It's more fundamental than anything, and as with pretty much anything in welding, you want a happy medium. There's, you know, running too short an arc length is bad, and running too long an arc length is, in my opinion, even worse. But the arc is something that I tell people to imagine as a triangular, circular cone, pretty much. The wider part would be where your puddle is, and the narrowest part would be right after the tip of your tungsten electrode. And because of this, the further away from your puddle you are, the wider that cone's going to be and the more dispersed and the less direct that your arc is going to be, and uh, vice versa when you move in. You know, you're going to have a very small, narrow, dense, so to speak, cone of arc awesomeness, and uh, you're going to have a little bit more of a focused arc. Now, what are the problems with running too long or too short of an arc length? Well, if you're way back here, then, well, you have a really unfocused, so to speak, arc. Your arc's going to be going everywhere. You know, we're going to be melting some over here and some over here, maybe a little bit back here and some up here. And, uh, but if you run too short of an arc length, which you also don't want to do, then your puddle, as you know, Imagine your little fluid puddle. Every time you dip the filler rod in, your puddle swells up a little bit before the filler rod, you know, runs out into the sides of your weldment. 
And, um, and then every time you add a bit of filler rod and your puddle goes up, it's going to hit the tip of your tungsten. That's how you know if you're running too short of an arc length. And uh, like I said, if you're running too long of an arc length, then your arc is really indirect and everywhere, and it's kind of messy looking, so to speak. You'll get something that looks kind of like that weld that we did way too hot, but I'll show you this in a minute. Now, how long of an arc length do I like, you ask? Um, well, I think what most people would go for would be a shorter arc length rather than a longer arc length. I will say if you're coming over to TIG from another process, be it stick or MIG, you're probably going to want to hold that tungsten in there a lot closer than you'd hold in a stick electrode or your MIG nozzle. Uh, but what I'll do is I listen for sort of a snapping sound every time you hear, well every time you dip the filler rod in there's going to be a little pop or a little snap, snapping sound. and. Um, well, that's, that's what I listen for. When I hear that, I like to think I have about the ideal arc length. But that's just for my preference. Some people might like it a little bit longer. Some people might even like it a little bit shorter. It's just something you're going to have to work with. But as a general rule of thumb, keep a really tight arc, and I like to listen for that sound. All right, let's run way too much of an arc length. And then way too little of an arc length. I'll do it in the same weld mitt so you all can see the, uh, you know, the transition from one to the other. And that's the arc length demonstration. <laughs> yeah, when I started off back here, as you can see that weld might be a little bit cold, but regardless, I tried to hold about the proper arc length through it. And then you can see where I pulled the torch back and let the arc go all over the place. We have some undercut from putting heat where there's uh, not really enough metal, i.e. having a really indirect arc that just kind of goes everywhere and does whatever it wants. And again, like I said, this looks somewhat like running too hot. I mean, it's just, it's kind of a hot mess. And then over here, this is too short of an arc. It pretty much, you know, I just dipped the tungsten in a bunch of times because there obviously wasn't quite enough space between the, uh, you know, the tip of the tungsten and the weld puddle. And just another thing that I thought I'd add in YouTube, uh, another reason to not run your arc too long is because when you're there, when there's a lot of distance between the tip of your tungsten and your weld puddle, well there's a lot of distance between the tip of the tungsten and the weld puddle, and in that space your shielding gas might start to dissipate, and uh, or it'll be more prone to be affected by drafts in your shop, slight breezes, you know, near moron coworkers blowing on it while you're trying to weld, things along those lines. And uh, so if you're having porosity issues, maybe you're holding your TIG torch a little bit far back from your, uh, from your weld mitt. Now, as you can imagine, I think we covered just about all the problems you might have with running too long of an arc length, but if you run too short of an arc length, you know, like I said and like I demonstrated, well the main problem you're going to have is sticking the tungsten all the time. Now for me, this is about a perfectly sharpened tungsten, I mean that's about how I like them. Probably two and a half to three electrode diameters, you know, that's the length of the taper. Uh, but this, on the other hand, is a tungsten that really needs to be sharpened. How do you know when your tungstens are contaminated? There's the obvious answer of where there was once a nice sharp tip, there's now a blob of molten crap, <laughs> and just depending on whatever it is that you're welding. Uh, but the less obvious answer, if you're welding and maybe it kind of is still okay in a way, it's got a few more inches of weld left, maybe you can finish out your joint. You'll know when your tungsten's kind of effed up when, when your arc starts to change. I mean, you know, it's like with the arc length thing almost. If you're running a nice short arc, then you have the nice fine cone, but 
having a glob of crap instead of a sharp point will kind of start to change the characteristics of the arc and it'll kind of go everywhere. You might get a little bit of undercut. Maybe you'll get some soot, like some smoky stuff around your well. That can also be caused by not enough shielding gas. We'll hit on that later on in the video. Uh, but those are some of the ways that you'll be able to tell when your tungsten ideally needs to be sharpened. Now everybody's going to tell you, oh, as soon as you dip your tungsten or touch it once, then, uh, then you got to stop and change it. And what do I say to that? Well, you know, to be honest, from everything I've seen and seen other people do and personally done, I don't think many people actually 100% adhere to that rule. Um, but... You know, officially what I recommend is if you're just practicing or you're working on something totally and 100% non-critical, then as soon as your arc starts to deteriorate, switch out your tungsten. A lot of it's going to come down to the various tungsten types that there are. For instance, pure tungsten uh, just doesn't work well at all once it's been in any way, shape, or form contaminated. You know, some of the tungstens with other things mixed in like cerium and thorium, those are some of the better ones, will be a little bit more resistant to crap accumulating on them and maybe you can get away with a little bit more with those tungstens. But if you're working on anything critical or you're taking an x-ray test or anything along those lines, as soon as you dip it, yeah, you should probably really switch that out. Because not only will you have sort of a crappy well because, you know, your arc's kind of everywhere and it's starting to become sort of a hot mess, you can also have what's referred to as, as tungsten spitting, uh, which can be caused by bits of crap shooting off your tungsten into the weld puddle, and even if you don't see it going on, it's there, and that can compromise your weld and cause you to fail a test, among other things. And just something else to mention, YouTube, as you can see by that red band, um, well, as you know, this is just a 2% thoriated tungsten of the 332nd inch diameter, and this is what I primarily run. I wasn't going to say this either way because there's like two or three different types of tungstens floating around in the shop, but these 2% thoriated tungstens are great for a lot of things, and they have a high resistance to being dipped and to bad things happening to them. I find you can weld for a lot longer with one of these and with a pure tungsten or some of the other varieties before you, before you have to, uh, you know, take it and grind it. But the next thing we're going to talk about pretty much goes hand in hand with arc length, and that is stick out. Now electrode stick out, or electrode extension as some people refer to it as, as you can mention, as you can imagine rather, is simply the distance that, that piece of tungsten sticks out from our awesome pink nozzle. And this is not something that says, you know, in depth of a lesson as, you know, amperage or arc length. There are a few other things we're going to talk about here. Primarily with stick out, if it's too short, then you're going to be a, not able to see what's going on because if, uh, if I had this here, you can't really, it sort of blocks most of your field of view unless you're a camera, you know, if you're looking down at it, you're not really going to see much. Or if you can't really get into what you're welding. I mean, if, the, if your nozzle is hitting on your parent material and you're running way too long of an arc length, well, then pretty much all you have to do is pull your tungsten out a little bit further. This, on the other hand, is extreme stick out. And, um, well, like I said, stick out is primarily going to be determined by what it is that you're welding and how far you need that electrode to protrude from the nozzle so you can get in there and weld with the proper arc length. But if I tried to weld with this, then our shielding gas is going to be coming out up here and our welding action is going on down here and it's going to disperse and go everywhere and um, and it's not going to go well. We're going to have horrendous porosity, a lot of the soot that I'm pointing at here. Um, it's just, it's going to be a really bad time. So stick out to make a long story short is determined by the type of joint that you're welding. You know, a lap joint is going to re require a lot less stick out than a fillet weld or an inside corner joint, something like this. And uh, this is way too much. This is what I see a lot of people do. This is what I used to do, actually. I'd stick mine out to about there and call it good. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, too much stick out equals porosity. Not enough equals hitting your nozzle on things. You're trying to get in there and weld them or not being able to see what's going on. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was stick out, which was suggested to us by our good friend on Facebook, David. Thanks for the idea, David. All right, uh, so the next thing we're going to talk about is filler rod size. Now, this is one of those things where people will have a lot of rules of thumb, which personally I don't particularly like to go by. I mean, one of the best pieces of welding advice I ever got was from one of my teachers. He said, 
You can never say never with welding. I mean, you know, welding this type of joint with this parameter might not work on this material, but it'll work great on this material, so you should never say doing this with this is a bad idea, because for this it might be, for this it might not be. And that's how I feel about a lot of the rules of thumb you're gonna hear welding-wise, particularly with filler rod size. But speaking of filler rod, uh, how do you know what to use, basically? Well, you know, you're probably not gonna like my answer, but it's one of those things you're just gonna have to get the feel for. But here's another real quick tip for you. I'll just throw this in here, even though it's a little bit off topic. I'm holding this torch up, and it's a little bit heavy, and my lead is down here, so what I'm gonna do, is there a truck backing in somewhere? Right, I'm back, YouTube. Okay, so, yeah, if you're holding up your torch and uh, it's getting kind of heavy, maybe it's affecting your weld, all you gotta do is take your lead, put it over your shoulder, you'll be good. Some people tell you to wrap it around your neck or your arm or something. I think primarily that's bad advice because, you know, if you're in a shop type environment and a forklift drives by and it catches your lead, it'll pull your arm off or whatever. But, um, okay, anyway, I'll just drape this over my shoulder here. Filler rod size, let's do it. If you're welding with too large of a filler rod, you're going to either have a cold weld, this is scenario one. Scenario one is that you have a cold weld because your, even though your torch is putting out enough heat to adequately melt the base material in a proper sized filler rod, you're adding too much metal. So your heat to metal equation is off. It's not the right ratio which it needs to be because, well, you're just plain shoving too much filler rod in there. So you crank up your amperage and then that way you can melt the larger filler rod, but then you're welding too hot for the joint. Maybe you still have undercut in extreme cases. Maybe you burn through. Either way, it's a bad time and it just plain doesn't feel right. And that's scenario one. Scenario two is that you really know what's going on and you're trying to limit the amount of metal that your larger filler rod puts into the joint. Now, how do you do that, you ask? With tiny little dips. Now, keep in mind, think of what you do when you're TIG welding and everything's just going great. And uh, think of that as a standard dip every time you dip the filler rod. If you're trying to limit the amount of metal that your filler rod's putting in, you just dip it for a real quick second or maybe you, uh, you know, you just set it right in front of the puddle and, it, and then you just run the tungsten over and it sucks a little bit off. You know, if it feels like you have to work to not have a puddle that's enormous and cold and convex, you might be using too large a filler rod. Now, what if you're using too small a filler rod? As you can imagine, the extreme opposite happens. You're welding along, welding along, and you're thinking, boy, that filler rod sure is going pretty quick. And, um, and maybe... Well, okay, I'll put it this way. Again, your heat to metal equation is off. Although you're, again, set to adequately melt the two pieces of parent material that you're working with, you're just not putting in enough metal with the smaller filler rod. And because of that, you're still getting undercut. You're getting all those symptoms we had that we showed you all earlier with welding too hot because you're welding too hot. Even though you're set right, you have the heat right, you still have the filler metal amount wrong. And because of that, it's still not welding right. You're still welding too hot. And uh, so if you're welding with too small of a filler rod, there's that, which I just described. And also, your filler rod could ball up. I won't say this is what only causes that because a horrendously wrong torch angle can cause this too. I mean, if this is your standard torch angle, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of a push angle, then uh, the heat's primarily directed down. But if you're going if you're going at your welding joint like this, all the heat's sort of, in a way, ricocheting off what you're welding, and it's gonna hit your filler rod because it's here, and this'll cause it to ball up, and the bit of it to melt off at the end, and bad things like that. So that's one thing that you'll have to keep an eye out for if you're welding with too small of a filler rod. But the main thing is, it's just gonna go really fast because you have to shovel that thing in there in order to keep the amount of metal in sync with the amount of heat that you're putting in. A big thanks to Brian for suggesting that surprisingly long rambling topic. All right, next up we're gonna be talking about shielding gas. TIG, as you probably know, is a gas shielded process, which means, you know, you got your weld puddle, and if nothing shields your weld puddle, then various things in the atmosphere screw with it. I'll put it that way, and you end up with horrendous porosity, really ugly welds, and, um, and the like. And, you know, you have your shielding gas, which flows through your torch and out this awesome pink noozle. Yes, I seriously call it that day-to-day -day personal life. And that's what blankets your weld puddle and prevents bad things from happening to it. 
That's how I'll describe it in under 10 minutes. All right, so uh, basically for TIG welding primarily, you're gonna wanna use argon compress. Yeah, compressed argon. Next question, how much argon do you wanna use? Um, well, normally for most things, as a general rule of thumb, I'll say 20 to 30 cubic feet an hour or metric equivalent. How do you know if you're not using enough argon? Uh, well, worst case scenario is you have horrendous porosity. Let's see what that looks like. All right, basically what I've done is I've gone ahead and turned off our shielding gas cylinder, and uh, but there's still some gas in the line, so we're gonna be okay for a few seconds, and then you'll see what it's like to weld with no argon whatsoever, because argon's for noobs, you don't actually need that stuff. Wow, we literally left a gigantic smoking crater and a piece of 316 steel. <laughs> yeah, it worked fine there for a second or two. Now that's what it looks like on what we were welding. Let's see our tungsten or what's left of it. Hmm, did not fare much better. As you can see, there's some of that awesome spatter just all over the nozzle. I'm sure that's good for it. And our tungsten is a blackened dull mess. All right, now that YouTube was pretty extreme, but let's see what happens if instead of using no shielding gas whatsoever, you don't use enough, because I think that's what people are more likely to have problems with. Instead of setting this to, what was it, like 27 or so, I'm gonna set this to 10 cubic feet an hour. All right, that one actually took two takes. The first weld, as you can see, the one closest to the camera, um, it crackled a little bit, but the finished weld actually looked kind of okay. The second one, though, that, that was really what I was hoping to capture. I'm sure y'all heard that crackling pretty much all the way through. And uh, we actually have a bit less porosity than I would have expected, pretty much just a bit at the, uh, the beginning and then the end. Uh, maybe there's more if we, like, you know, x-ray it or ground it down or whatever. But primarily, if you're not getting enough shielding gas, it's going to look something like that. You'll have some porosity issues, you'll have a lot of smoke, maybe not that much, but that's, in my experience, one of the main things that causes that soot residue around the TIG weld, you know, either that or effed up tungsten. Uh, but also, it's worth noting that these welds both have kind of a crackly gray appearance. Sometimes that can be caused by, uh, you know, not enough shielding gas. And uh, so, shielding gas, there you go. Next thing we're going to talk about is polarities. TIG welding is pretty much never done on electrode positive. I watched a video when I was in school of someone doing it on electrode positive once. We didn't even try it there. 99% of TIG welding on DC is done electrode negative, and if you're welding aluminum, then you probably want alternating current, you know, AC. Um, and pretty much this means that you want the torch, your torch lead, to go into the negative side of your welder and your ground lead of course goes into the positive and if you're having issues with this it's probably either because you're just setting up your machine and you set it up wrong and you know if you if you're doing that there's no shame in it if if what you're experiencing is what we're about to demonstrate then uh, maybe you know even if you think it's set up okay just go switch them anyway just to see what happens but regardless now that we got that out of the way I think we've covered just about everything that's on my list of things to cover except for one thing on my list of things to cover. And that is what happens when you TIG weld with the wrong shielding gas. Primarily what happens when somebody doesn't fully understand that there's a difference between pure argon and 75% argon, 25% carbon dioxide, and they put a C25 cylinder on a TIG welder, um, well it doesn't weld worth anything, the puddle's kind of gloppy and hard to control and it's going to be probably pretty porous. I've actually had this happen unintentionally, but somebody did that and that's what happened. It looks it looks and runs about the same as the uh, the not welding with enough shielding gas, with the right kind of shielding gas. So again, a big thanks to Brandon, Keith, Brian, and David. I really appreciate your helpful suggestions. 
And to everybody watching this video, I really hope it has helped you out. Um, I mean, like I said, this is everything I could think to fit into a TIG weld troubleshooting video. And hopefully you've gone from, why does my weld look like this and not like this, to, I think I'm doing this wrong. I think I have this set wrong. I don't think I have that set right. And, uh, you know, pretty much all you have to do is go out there and practice, practice, practice. You know, it's, it's like I always say, welding isn't very hard, but it has one brutal learning curve. I mean, it's, it, it is what it is, and you get out of it what you put into it. That's another thing. Welding, it, it's, it's one of those things where at one end of the spectrum, you have somebody that does production work or random repairs and whatnot and then on the other end of the spectrum you have people that make insane amounts of money welding pipelines doing exotic metals things along those lines you know if you're just watching this video and you're new, newer to welding newer to TIG welding welcome to the trade and uh, you'll get out of it whatever you put into it it always works out so um, yeah I guess we covered about everything and I'd like to thank each and every one of y'all for watching this, and I hope it helps you out. Happy welding, everybody. Yeehaw.